Hello everyone and welcome to part 2 of my video on the M drive. In this video, I'll discuss several theories that have been proposed to explain that it works. If you're interested in learning about why it's considered to be impossible, as well as hearing about NASA's latest peer-reviewed paper, just please go and check out part 1. If you want to hear about a specific theory, I'll have links in the description with time codes for each of them. So let's get started. Number 1. Really all you need to defeat Scheuer's theory is the thought experiment I did in part 1. Conservation of momentum is violated, and classical electromagnetism can be proven to conserve momentum, but still, it'd be nice to have an explanation of what is actually going on. The claim is that as microwaves move from the smaller end to the larger end, their wavelength becomes smaller, they become compressed, and as they move from the larger end to the smaller end, their wavelength becomes larger, they become stretched. This is supposed to be because the M drive is an asymmetric waveguide, and a waveguide does exactly what it says on the tin. It's a little questionable, but I'll take it at face value. He then invokes a relation from quantum mechanics, that the momentum of a photon is inversely proportional to its wavelength. Thus, the idea goes, the photons impact the large end more forcefully than the small end. So there's a net force, or thrust. One problem with the argument is that this is a very complicated macroscopic object. Each second, there is something like 10 to the 27 photons being pumped into the M drive, so quantum mechanics is not the right tool for the job. For instance, some of these photons will get absorbed by the sidewalls. The worst problem, though, is that he's ignoring the physics that allows the waves to be stretched and compressed. Put another way, if an electromagnetic wave of shorter wavelength has more momentum, where did the extra momentum come from? Copper is a conductor. Its atoms are arranged in a lattice. Some of the electrons are free to move and roam the entire material. That's why it conducts electricity so well. When a microwave hits a piece of copper, the electromagnetic fields accelerate the electrons on the surface of the metal. These electrons then emit radiation of their own. The final result is a combination of the original wave with the re-radiated one. For the case of copper, this happens very fast, and that's what allows it to guide waves in the first place. Shore's error has now become clear. As microwaves bounce around inside the cavity, electrons in the sidewalls will also slosh back and forth. It's almost as if the wave had to push against the sidewalls to propel itself towards the large end. When this effect is taken into account, the thrust disappears. Number 2. Mike McCulloch is a British oceanographer who has proposed to explain the M-drive via modified inertia by a Hubble-scale Casimir effect, or MIHSC. The idea goes back to something called UNRA radiation, which is a rather counterintuitive prediction of quantum field theory. What it is, and I'll state this very carefully, is the following. Imagine you're in a spaceship equipped with a particle detector and accelerating at a constant rate. The UNRWA effect is a statement that your detector will click at the same rate that it would if it were immersed in a gas at the so-called UNRWA temperature, which is proportional to the acceleration. Sometimes you see people describing this like, an accelerated observer sees a thermal bath, but that's too sloppy for the purpose at hand, and you'll see why in a minute. This effect so far has not been detected experimentally, and it probably never will, because the constant of proportionality between acceleration and temperature is extremely tiny. In order to get an UNRWA temperature of about 4 degrees above absolute zero, you would need to accelerate at about 100 quintillion Gs. That's 1 with 20 zeros in front of it. McCulloch claims that this effect is responsible for inertia. He invokes the Casimir effect which is a quantum mechanical attraction between two parallel conducting plates due to the fact that only certain wavelengths of light are allowed between them. It's also a tiny effect, but this one's actually measurable. The experiment was performed in 97 by Lemro. For plates separated about 1 micrometer, he measured a force of about 30 nanograms. That's the weight of a grain of pollen, and it diminishes very rapidly with distance. There's just one more thing I need to explain before I get to the meat of things. There are regions in the universe whose light will never reach us. This is because the universe is expanding and light hasn't had enough time to catch up with us. These regions are covered by what we call a cosmological horizon. Something similar happens if you're accelerating. Some regions of the universe will be hidden from you, covered by what we call a Rindler horizon. Now I'm ready to explain to you what this MIHSC thing actually is. The claim is this. UNRWA radiation that radiation seen by an accelerated detector, can only come in wavelengths that fit between the cosmic horizon and the Rindler horizon. 
That's a rather strong assertion made without justification. There's no physical mechanism that would cause this. But I'll take it. He then says that unrobe radiation pressure is the cause for inertia. Let's check the standard textbook for this kind of stuff, which is Burrell and Davies. Davies, by the way, was one of the guys who discovered the UNRWA effect. In page 54, they say this. It is often stated that a uniformly accelerated observer will see thermal radiation. However, both accelerated and unaccelerated observers agree that the stress energy momentum of the field vanishes. In layman's terms, what they're saying here is, UNRWA radiation does not exert pressure. That's why it was so important for me to define it very carefully before. But even if it did, we'd be looking at a tiny correction on top of a minuscule effect. Not a dramatic, everyday observation like, things have inertia. He never calculates a large effect, by the way. He just assumes that it's there. And by the way, the final product of his paper is a force that resists acceleration. If you believe in forces, you believe in F equals MA which means that you believe that objects won't change their state of motion unless acted on by a force. In other words, you already believe in inertia. McCulloch's argument is circular. MIHSC is not even wrong. Number 3. Finnish physicist Arto Annila, hope I'm pronouncing that right, has suggested that the M-drive does have an exhaust made up of photons that destructively interfere with one another. He mentions the two-slit experiment. If the crest of one wave meets the trough of another, they interfere destructively and cancel out. So the exhaust of the M-drive would comprise photons that are destructively interfering everywhere. Here's a problem, though. If the photons destructively interfere everywhere outside the cavity, the probability of finding them anywhere outside the cavity is zero, which means that in every sense of the word, they're just not there. And even if they were, this would be a photon thruster, so you'd still have to pay 300 megawatts for each newton of thrust. Number 4. The idea of using the quantum vacuum for propulsion is not new. The first time I saw the concept was in a 1986 book by Arthur Clarke, The Songs of Distant Earth. It's a good book, by the way, you should read it. What people were talking about back then was the so-called zero-point energy. There was this idea that one cubic centimeter of vacuum contained enough energy to boil off all of the Earth's oceans. Physicists never really believed this, but over time it became clear that this view of the vacuum can't possibly be right. First of all, these were all very naive quantum field theory calculations. Quantum field theory doesn't know about absolute energies, it can only tell you about energy differences. So strictly speaking, you can't use it to predict the energy of the vacuum. Secondly, the energy of the vacuum has actually been measured, for example by the WMAP satellite which looked at the cosmic microwave background. Its value is not astonishingly large, it's astonishingly small. It's only about a joule per cubic kilometer. You may have heard of it before. It goes by many names these days. Cosmological constant, dark energy, it's all the same thing. Because of this, nobody really talks about extracting vacuum energy anymore. But the dream has endured. And now we talk about pushing against the quantum vacuum virtual plasma. This quantum vacuum virtual plasma is certainly not the kind of thing that you'd find in a textbook. None of these, at least. Or as John Bay has said, quantum vacuum virtual plasma is something you'd say if you failed a course in quantum field theory and then smoked too much weed. All of this seems to stem from misconceptions about the nature of the vacuum. What you'll often hear is that the vacuum is a sea of electron and positron pairs that pop into and out of existence as they spontaneously create and annihilate. That is very common, but it's a myth. The quantum mechanical vacuum does have interesting properties. To discuss them, we often employ what are called <clears throat> vacuum diagrams. If interpreted carelessly, they make it seem like this seething, frothing sea of particles view of the vacuum is correct. I won't get into too much detail into how they work, but the basic idea is that these lines really represent terms in a mathematical expression rather than literal particles, which is why they're called virtual particles. We know they're not real particles because we invented them. They're part of a mathematical machinery for computing useful quantities known as perturbation theory. Depending on the details of how you apply this method, you get different types of virtual particles. Some of them may even be completely fictitious. For solving certain problems, you may choose a different method with no virtual particles at all. For example, the Casimir effect is typically calculated without any reference to virtual particles whatsoever. If you're getting lost by now, a good rule of thumb is that any particle you can directly interact with, any particle you push, pull, and so on, is a real particle, not a virtual one. 
There are other problems with the idea of using the vacuum for propulsion like a boat uses the water. One of them comes from special relativity. Our extremely successful theories of particle physics all hold that the vacuum is the same whether I'm standing still or sitting in a moving train. Harold White suggests that momentum is conserved if you push against the vacuum, provided there's a wake in the vacuum. That presumes that special relativity is wrong in a very deep way. The observer in the station would have a very different view of the vacuum than the observer in the train. If you want to keep special relativity, you must create real particles and toss them out the back. I possess one device capable of doing that. But in fact, the mere possibility of having more than one vacuum state has far-reaching consequences for particle physics. You may have heard of the Higgs mechanism, which not only gives elementary particles mass, but also changes what kinds of forces and particles exist in the universe. Without this mechanism, the electron would be massless and atoms would not exist. It all happens because there is more than one vacuum state. If, as Harold White suggests, there were lots of different vacuum states, just like there are lots of different states of water in a swimming pool, the universe would likely be a very different place. In his latest paper, he also suggests that pilot wave theory may have something to do with it. There's no calculation to support it, though. He just asserts it. Pilot wave theory really deserves a video all for itself. But for now, I'll just state, all of the arguments I just gave follow through even if a pilot wave theory were in fact correct. So pilot wave theory can't rescue the quantum vacuum thruster. Number 5. I've seen the suggestion floating around, but I don't know who came up with it first. Could the M drive be pushing against dark matter? I'm going to ignore that dark matter is incredibly difficult to interact with. So far, we haven't been able to do it, even with the most sophisticated detectors we could build. The big problem is that there simply isn't enough of it. In the entire volume of the Earth, there should only be one kilogram of the stuff. Even if we had no problem interacting with it, a dark matter propeller that could reproduce experimental results from Eagle Works would have to be about a quarter of a mile wide. Could it be pushing on some other kind of matter? Not dark matter, but something even more elusive, something even gravity can't sense. Unless general relativity is extremely wrong, gravity is a universal force. If you can interact with something, so can gravity. If there existed particles that did not interact with gravity, we'd never find out about them, with an M drive or otherwise. Number 6. The Mach principle is a very old idea. Imagine a bucket of water. If you spin it, the surface of the water will curve because of the centrifugal force. But what happens if you rotate the rest of the universe around the bucket? Mach's principle is the idea that the water will curve too. Inertia would be, in some sense, the effect of some interaction with the distant stars. To be clear, general relativity doesn't satisfy this but it's at least conceivable that some other theory could. To date, however, no Machian theory has appeared that is as experimentally successful as general relativity. There have been suggestions, notably by James Woodward, that if the Mach principle were correct, a reactionless space drive could be built. That's not true. A theory based on Mach's principle would also have to deal with Notus theorem. The mere fact that there are no special places in the universe means the momentum is conserved. What's more, it's locally conserved which means the momentum cannot be instantly teleported all the way from here to the distant stars. It must be carried there by something. So we're back to a photon thruster. So there you have it. I hope I've given you a taste of just how hard it is to come up with a theory for the M-Drive that makes any sense. Since there is no theory and no reliable experiment, I hope I demonstrated to you that skepticism of the M-Drive is not at all the most unscientific approach. Thank you very much for joining me. I'll see you next time.